Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about animating fantasy worlds with Mojo with Felipe Vargas and Spiro Munster. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that we'd like to go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. There will be a Q&A session during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all the questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Mario Quinones, myself, Felipe Vargas, and Spiro Munster. We invite you to share your Instagram stories about the webinar using hashtag webinar, hashtag Mojo Animation at Vargas Lubert, at Spiro underscore Bunster, and at Mojo Animation. We'll be sharing your stories. Spiro and Felipe are a freelance motion designer duo that collaborate frequently on 2D animation projects. They share a passion for vivid storytelling, expressive and naturalistic animation, and relaxed but thoughtfully planned way to approach animation. Felipe is represented in North America by Closer and Closer, and in Europe by Outline Artists. And with that, I will leave you with Felipe and Spiro with their webinar, Animating Fantasy Worlds with Moho. Thank you so much. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mario, can you hear me? Yes, all working. Great. So, um, it's super nice to be here. I want to thank you, everyone, uh, each of one of you for attending. And also, uh, we're closing a really nice year, and I want to thank each and everyone that has sent nice comments and has even asked questions or, or shared our work. Uh, it's been a a, a really nice uh, 2023 and we hope to make more of this in the in the future so stay tuned the first things uh, a little bit about ourselves uh, i am felipe and right next to me is my friend spiro and we're a freelance motion designer duo from from chile i'm now presenting from rancagua and spiro is now presenting from viña del mar uh, you can see below our Instagram handles if you want to follow us. Uh, the main thing with Spiro is that uh, we met a while ago while working in the agency circuit. Uh, the nice thing about uh, working in agencies is that you learn about other ways of working and like other workflows, etc. But they don't always adapt uh, with how do you live or how do you, do you think sh things should work. But with Spiro, uh, we have developed a like a deep substance of trust, confidence, and we're like really relaxed, but thoughtful and very passionate about what uh, we do. I hope it comes through in the presentation. So when Mojo approached us to talk about animating fantasy worlds, uh, I think they're referring basically to our ongoing series of collaborations we made for Tesos. A little bit of history or context Tesos is a blockchain. It's not uh, the Bitcoin itself, but it's the underlying technology that powers Web3 uh, for transactions, for contracts, for ledgers, uh, accountability, etc. It's like the infrastructure that provides like decentralization. Obviously, uh, it's tough to explain just in words, and but the main thing I want to convey is that Tesos, as a blockchain, evolves organically, democratically, and very fast throughout the years. So they approached me uh, to design videos that like motivate and hype each person, that each one of these persons received a name of the city, maybe sometimes an ancient city, etc. And the most uh, mundane ex uh, example is the, the first version I did with them, which was called Protocol Hangzhou. Uh, it was based in the city of China, uh, Hangzhou, and each of the features we decided it will be like a element of the city, like views, as you see on the right, is like this giant conference uh, room that is in the port that opens up and lets you see like the transaction block that's in the middle, like and 
like literally a ship like can inspect inside every building. Uh, cache, which is like the memory, uh, was literally presented in the port. Uh, you see, you can see on the left like a RAM stick. On the right, there's an SSD like a hard drive, and it makes the ship go faster. And on the right, it's like a small tree to Blade Runner, like this huge brutalist spaces, but it was like an archival, like a archive of code that reside inside this giant sphere. So each feature that was like uh, very difficult to explain in words because it was programming and it was in, in this difficult language, we represented with these visual metaphors. And the client really, really loved it. And so do we. So when Spiro joined me on the next versions, things turned a little bit more fantastic and the metaphors became a little bit more about a sensation that we wanted to convey. In Ithaca, for example, uh, based on the island near Greece, uh, the thing was about like organic growth uh, that generated from a change of code, like a change in the in the matrix generated like this huge island that emerged from the sea. And the trip of Odysseus uh, firing a magical arrow into the code itself and creating all this like natural beauty uh, was like the perfect way to tell the story. And obviously like a lot of uh, chances to implement Easter eggs and hidden messages for the lovers of the, of the product. The next one was Lima, and this uh, was all about um, generating a tribute to the other versions. So you can see in the monuments that are floating, each one of them has a logo of a previous version, but they all converge around the city of Lima. And in the middle of the city of Lima, like the next monument emerges, and it's more colorful, it's running by all this natural beauty, etc. It's like a gathering of sorts to celebrate the new version. Um, Short story like Lima is really similar to Santiago in, in its aspect. It's a Latin American city and it wasn't so much based on an Asian culture. So I decided to turn my attention to the Altiplan itself, uh, its beauty, its uh, colors, and the beautiful stonework that the Tiwanaku culture does. Uh, you can see like in the monuments and the artifacts that are floating, like they're all made of stone that is like perfectly cut and with like uh, intricate shapes and patterns. Uh, obviously, the robots are wearing uh, clothes that are very colorful, inspired by the textiles you can find in Lima, etc. Then along came Mumbai. Uh, as you can see, the client was like really excited about all the exploration and keep like uh, requesting them. Uh, Mumbai was all about the scalability, like uh, the ability to scale. And Mumbai is also like the entry port of India. So the best idea was to represent massive scale with a massive number of different ships. Like Tesos wanted to acknowledge that there are other networks and they were represented by other ships with other languages, ways of flying, but they all converge and join together our, our protagonist. Again, like the colors, the textiles, uh, things that are inspired by fabric, by sandals, ships that are uh, made of different like Indian old artifacts, objects, boats, ships, Everything like goes into the screen. And the last one we did uh, recently is for Nairobi. Nairobi is the capital of Kenya in Africa. And this upgrade was all about speed. So the obvious choice was a race across the savanna. Uh, sometimes uh, some choices came from my side. I just took a, a look at my portfolio at the moment and I noticed everything I was doing like for the past few years was blue. <laughs> Uh, which is my favorite color, but okay, let's do something red uh, and go against the grain. But uh, each one of these projects uh, has been a huge chance to learn stuff, to try new stuff, to like to grow in in our design journey, in our uh, journeys and innovators. I deeply believe when, that when a client like uh, gives you so much trust and lets you collaborate on their projects, like you really want to give them back the best you can. And we want to put uh, both Spiro and I, the most love we can put on each of these projects. But the problem is there are still regular projects, there are still jobs. And so how, how can we give it all without compromising our creative vision, but with only a team of two people with limited resources and obviously with limited time? and especially without sacrificing our lives in the process. 
obviously the answer is using Moho software <laughs> and but also applying our thought process and implementing a, a way of working that feels both natural and efficient. So um, here are some things we learned. The first thing and the most important and difficult for me is to get that first image right. Uh, this is the capital of Nairobi, uh, of Kenya, Nairobi. Uh, and many people ask me when I'm designing or when they see my work, they ask, how do you decide if it works, if it doesn't? How do you know if you're doing something that's right or wrong in a design sense? And the first thing come, that comes to mind is it must feel right. I think good design and I think good communication must make feel someone else something and there must be a connection a human connection the answer to how do you achieve that is you must really 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 feel excited about your own work about the thing that you are doing it doesn't matter how it looks in the moment it, it must keep you excited to advance into the next step right for example if i'm drawing this city and i oh i noticed that uh, color combination is nice or something I'm trying is going in the right direction I go myself into that direction I let the design like guide me uh, through my emotions uh, into what I want to achieve uh, a musician from the past did a like a really good quote about this is that if you really 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 love something everyone will love it uh, maybe some people will hate it but it will won't cause indifference like if you really if it awakes something in you it will surely awake something in others. Obviously, the difficult thing is how do you do that in yourself? And that is by looking and feeling stuff when looking stuff. Uh, then you can create being connected to what are you creating instead of just drawing. Uh, and also like really immersed in the in the culture and get excited not only about colors, about shapes but about images and real things that are actually like influencing or are related to your work. Many people thought like the buildings in Nairobi were like ultra sci-fi, but as you can see, they're literally taken from actual buildings in Nairobi, as you can see on the top tower, that looks like a lotus flower opening up. The robots uh, kind of emerge as artifacts that are influenced by textures in all uh, African objects. The mountains all resemble actual uh, mountains directly taken from the surrounding area and i found a lot of patterns that were circular and uh, shaped like a spiral and those patterns reflected in the tribals in the jewelry in the textiles in everywhere and i applied the same shapes like some major emerging from the ground like applied to different stuff and things and that uh, really got me excited really got me going uh, each, 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 each time you see something that gets you motivated into the next step, like follow that. Uh, that will be my, my, my experience. Then after you make that uh, first time frame, which is tough, but uh, it's very important. Everything makes, makes sense. Like uh, you don't have to think much anymore. You just flow within the language you already created. So for example, on the ships above, you can see it's the same idea of those like hanging clothes uh, in a spaceship, the circular patterns, the ornamentation, the jewelry, the beds, like hanging from a pole, uh, the colors, uh, a ship that represents the sun, literally has a sun floating on its core, and the other ship maybe represents the moon, so I put a little moon on, on it. Uh, everything comes from somewhere. And I think that really translates into the project, and when the clients see it, they get it like instantly without needing to explain it so much. The second thing, and now we are talking about animation, uh, is something I really uh, use, is this phrase that less is beautiful. Uh, in the time I was working uh, in the agencies, in the time I was doing more like a normal motion animation work, there was a trend to like really use a lot of transitions, like use like really expressive movement, fast the scenes, like fast pace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that left me uh, in me a hunger to explore the other side, like uh, more peaceful, more calm, uh, more reflective scenes. And I think that not everything needs to be animated 
at 100% uh, of speed intensity all the time. Uh, I think when you, in my opinion, when you do something that that's at 100 every time, uh, it makes everything like a little numb. Like if everything goes at full speed, nothing goes really at full speed. But if instead, maybe the 50% of your scenes go at a slower pace, the other 50 will feel really fast in comparison. And also, I tend to grab a lot from observation and from life. I mostly get inspired by things that, that I actually observe instead that I actually look on the internet, etc. And real life happens at this pace. Like you can find beauty in the moments of a leaf, of a water in a window, in the rain, in the clouds. And I think all of these small and subtle movements come together in what do you see in the actual world. I don't think that uh, as we're giving the illusion of life, we also are giving the illusion of reality too. And I think reality works in this language. And as I said before, uh, when you do things that move you and inspire you personally, it can lend itself to inspiring other people. So I moved like in that direction for the last few years and it has given me great joy and I learned so much from it. This also applies to Moho too. For example, as you can see on the ship on the right side, there's a little secondary movement on their like uh, lancets that connect to its tail. And this feedbacks into the design, right? As you can see on the image of the top, like there are only three points that emerge from its tail that are actually overlapping and moving. Uh, so when I'm designing, I am keeping this animation in mind. When I'm designing the ship, I know that this is the part that will rotate like a wing. I know that the other wings will be static. So the design itself is inspired by the rigging that comes after, right? For example, I know that I have only to move three points at minimum. So it literally has three points and the curve like goes along with this. Uh, as you can see on the animation below, it's just a small loop. It's a small loop, an overlapping loop, nothing really complex, but it's a little bit offset with the other tail. And as you can see on the like little flags that are emerging from the other side, like all these little small movements compound and they add up. Uh, you don't have to do a, a really complex animation, but we have all these tiny movements. And as you can see, like particles in the background, the little flags, they influence your design. This, uh, as you make in the scene, you say, ah, I need to include some flags, some grass, some textiles, something that will react to the wind, etc." cetera. Uh, I think it's a really clever way to save time and also do the things you love. I personally love animating wind. I personally love animating little details and little stuff. This also obviously applies to characters. If you have an environment that is like breathing and like uh, doing background action, you can start to make your characters do small things, right? Uh, most of us aren't jumping and doing acrobatics all the time. And I think it's like really nice and proper to make moments that when characters reflect, when they just look at stuff, where they just can point at stuff, when they can just serve as a, a con accompaniment to the thing that's kind of happening on the screen. And as you can see on the right, for example, the pylon that is floating as a tribal shield, uh, like the cables that connect it to the ground, they only just have one point. That one point is connected to a bone that reacts to the wind in Moho. So it's like semi-automatic. And we also have a smartphone that controls the rotation of the this little spaceship. So it's as you can see, it's really, really, really simple stuff. But when it all adds together and when it works in conjunction with other things, you not only save time, but you create a scenes that work really well as a whole instead of a character moving on a static background. I think that really less is beautiful and reality it's also beautiful in this case. Another thing uh, we have in mind is always designing with the end animation inside. Uh, as you can see on this character, this is like the extreme example of that. You can see that her waist is just a point. Their, her torso is connected to the dress on like one point. And that was because we wanted to rotate here and we can save time designing about uh, about that animation. We can, for example, if we foresee that he she does something when we are drawing here, we can design here to just do that animation in the most efficient way possible, right? For example, in her case, she rotates. We have just only one point of connection to the waist, but the arms that are the main 
thing that is like really difficult to get into a rig are hidden inside of this uh, colorful red poncho, right? The knees of hair are hidden inside of the dress. So every point that is like difficult to work it is hidden actually, and we don't have to bother about it. Uh, but that leaves also room for us uh, that every time we save time, we can use it on another thing that is cool. For example, this character has a colorful and very expressive poncho because we save time on the knees, on the elbows, etc. cetera. Uh, this character has like really beautiful expressive hands that were obviously the center of the, the shot actually, because we wanted to center on, on what's important and she has like really expressive hands, she's optimized for rotation. So maybe in the, in the next scene you're working on, maybe you can ask yourself the question, do, you, do I really need all this, this detail or what is the action that this character is doing? Maybe if she's holding something, maybe the, the attention is on the hands and maybe you can save time. And that time instead reflects back into doing something cool like a flowing poncho that can flow in the wind, that can react to the rotation. And that, that I think that balances uh, that and makes your character more varied. Uh, you can try more different stuff. As you can see also her head is like really simple, etc. Uh, this is also a very good example, the archer from Ithaca. You can see that she has a hood uh, that looks both modern and ancient. But the main thing I want you to notice here is like the, the sides of her hoodie are very flat. You can see that uh, are, they are almost like low poly. Uh, and that was because we wanted to rotate it and like make it very understandable and easy to rotate. Uh, so that rigging influences back to, to the design. And I think that's a, a, a really nice advantage to have uh, when you're designing something. If you know how it will be rigged or you know how to rig it yourself, like it can influence back on the design without making it look cheap. It can be a source of unique ideas. It can be a source of inspiration. Uh, and rigging itself can be a source of uh, solutions that are come to the design and even the storyboarding process. Like when you know how it will be done afterwards, or how, in this case, Spiro will rig it, for example, I know that uh, I must do something that translates directly into the ring. You can see uh, on our example, for example, all of her joints, all of her knees, all of her elbows are black. You don't have to do actually do nothing in terms of smart bones. Instead, to rotate, you can put the layer on top of each other, etc. And the ornamentation is on top of it. So I think that when you save time on, on knees, on elbows, on shoulders, you can now add time to ornamentation, to a beautiful shapes that feel distinct, etc. I don't intend to this to be like a rule or something that is very rigid. Obviously, you can always experiment and do the thing that you really want to do. But these are some like things that have come in the end in this process. I think it it lends itself to to this kind of like a, a techniques. The fourth point is centering in things that are really easy to do in 3D. Uh, this comes along very similar to the point I did before, but as you can see on this Fisherman, that it comes from Protocol Mumbai, the thing that you can see that its head is like a cone. Uh, you can see like a pair of ears that are really flat protruding from the head and going to two opposite their directions. And you can see like a small orb that acts like a LED light uh, that indicates that this road is turned on. The back is just a, a simple curve, but when you all, all when you add all of these elements, it gives the illusion of something that looks 3D, right? Uh, when your design is made of simple shapes, you can have more expressive rotation, you can have uh, more extreme rotations, more easy rotations, and they translate like really well into the rigging. A better example, I think, is these companions robots, robots from Nairobi. You can see they have the share practically the same shape. They are all, as you can see, the same, 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 same shape in Mojo, and we are changing like the interior, right? Uh, like the exterior shapes, max, mask, everything that is on the inside, and again, every joint, every knee, every elbow of it, this robot is the same color, so you don't have problems right there. And you got ornamentation on the top, and for example, the nose of this one is clearly, clearly, clearly a, a triangle shape like prism. So you already know, and the speed already knows how this should look when it's rotating, right? Uh, he already knows that a sphere rotates in a way, a straight line rotates in another way. So when your character is just 
a bunch of simple shapes. They all work together to give the, the illusion of 3D. And here are the robots like doing their stuff. Another thing that is really, really cool is how to reutilize assets uh, without making it feel like you're reutilizing assets. Uh, in the case of Nairobi, we had like this beautiful bike that's actually inspired by African drum and like pots and artifacts that are hanging from the engine, etc. And it was something that we really wanted to use uh, a lot, and we wanted to like make it feel like really alive and animate like really beautifully. But the scene that we used it, it was looked from the side. I obviously did some drawings uh, like to aid the Spiro with the ring and the rotation of the bike. But we wanted to use the bikes in other scenes. And how can we use this uh, without making it to feel repetitive, without making it feel like you are just like going the easy option? You can see here, for example, that it's practically the same rig, practically the same view, but it feels different in the way it's, uh, it's looked. Like the camera exaggerates and everything in the environment exaggerates that the bike uh, isn't the same rig. When I handed these files to Spiro, he was surprised that the rig was the same. It's just an extreme position that can still rotate, but everything else in the environment makes the illusion that the, car, that the bike is actually like another piece of kit. Uh, the main thing, for example, is on the right. You can see that here and the environment is really accentuating that the bike isn't being looked from the side. But if you, if you pay close attention, you will see that the bike is actually on the side but it doesn't look like it's tipping over. I think the other thing that is like really important here is that you can see her head is pointing directly into the camera. And why I made this decision? Obviously, like her head, her head was like very important in the shot. And making a head rotate is obviously faster and easier if he is directly to the camera. So as you can see, the whole scene is looked from above, but the bike and her face are looking uh, in an orthogonal way. So uh, you can mix and make these sort of optical illusions to get the most of a rig. And you don't have like to rig so much complex action and you can let the environment like give the illusion that, that the character is facing in another direction. Uh, I think that like really complements well. And as you can see, that lets you make a really complex rig and use it for later. It influences back the design process. Uh, I think it, it, it is the most thing, the, the thing I, I want to convey most in my part of the presentation is that I really think that animation and knowledge of rigging influences you back on your design. I let it flow much better uh, one step into the other. I shall now leave you with Spiro. We, he will talk about the next part of this presentation. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mario, it's. Are you listening? It's working yes. so? Yes, okay. all working great. Thank you. Awesome. So, I'm going to show you some files of Moho that we work with, Felipe. And I'll start with this famous bike. <laughs> a lot of people ask me about this bike. So, I'm going to show you a little bit of this rig. Uh, some people ask me if I have some tricks or some secrets in Moho, but honestly, there are no secrets. I would say the only secret is to do this. That is, use a lot of layers and folders. That probably is the main secret for this nice rig. I spent like a day and a half, maybe a little bit more doing this rig, because as Felipe said, we knew that we, are, we were going to use it a lot. So, if you're if you knew if you know that you're going to use a rig a lot of time spend a lot of time in it for example here i separate everything legs hands the body even her earring for doing this movement so sorry so for doing this turn i only did one bone for the main movement, that was this. 
And if you notice, it's only one controller for doing the main movement. So when you start animating, it's, you only need to move this bone and already looks like this sensation of movement. So why I'm saying also it's really important to separate layers, it's mainly because you need to move sometimes the light or the shadow. And sometimes I have received some files where the characters have everything in the same layer and it's a little bit difficult to animate that way. So as a recommendation, I always say to separate everything, eyes, mouth, lights, whatever is in your character because that's going to make everything easier. Also because you have the chance to animate the order of the layers. So if you have everything separate, it's going to be way more uh, easier to move the order of these layers. For example, here I move some orders. You can notice in the right. And that is thanks separating everything. And one really important thing is name your layers. It's, <laughs> it's really important to put names because when you have these hundreds of layers, if you're in the layer number 100, it's going to be really difficult to, to have a proper order of these files. So continue with this. Um, as Felipe said, this is the same file. And as he said, I was really surprised it was the same bike. I was really happy to because I didn't want it to rig it again. So it was really nice to receive this bike. And the cool thing was I only had to change the head. So as you see, the only rig that I add was this for bones, like a blink or this, one mouth. It's not even a smile, but yeah, she opened her mouth. And the movement for the earrings, and of course, a movement for the head. But just with that, you can feel a different animation. So that's why you need to do a proper rig. You can reuse, re and that helps a lot and save a lot of time also to spend uh, creating a better animation. So here you have another example. As you can see, I have a lot of bones here. <laughs> it's completely different than this because here you see there's only these few bones, but in this case, the animation was completely different. So I spent a lot of time doing smart bones. So also create smart bones. You can even do a whole animation just with these smart bones. If you notice in this animation, this bone, these three bones, the head, neck, and body is barely moving, but all the rest of the bones are controlling her movement. For example, here I have a controller for this in and out animation of her threads. So move everything through these smart bones. Also, I did these small details, these small, sorry, these smart bones for these small details animating the perspective. Like, it's so simple to do this smart bone. It probably is going to take you, I don't know, one minute, two minutes, because it's only, uh, sorry, let's check this one. It's only moving the vertex to one side to the other. And if you combine the movement of the bones, of these bones, plus this, it looks really nice. It's more real, I think. So spend time adding some details. I think details in animations are one of the coolest things. For example, here, as you see, are these small movements of your eyes, like, She's moving just in one frame, her eyes, and it creates that feeling of that she's alive. It's not like a cartoon, it's more like a real character, like a real person. 
And also, for, for example, here I create these small bones for controlling her eyes. And I also move that. All these small movements helps a lot for creating a nice animation. Also here I move this. I have a small movement even for her chin. It's barely, you can barely notice, but this section is moving. And maybe it could it could be considered like small details, but I think all those small details are the most important things for animation to make something different. So do we always need to create thousands of layers? Mm, yes and no. For example, here, I only use one layer. Instead of redrawing all these boats, I decided to use one layer and a few bones. And that was enough for moving. And I create one turn. Sorry. And that was all. So don't feel push, I think is the right word, but don't feel push. Always using layers, if you need to save time, it's, it's good, I think, to use the PSD files. For example, here in the big boat, I love the colors that Felipe used and the light, everything. So I decided to use the same PSD file. So it's just an image and the same here. For example, in the small boat, I have this light. I really wanted to keep this light. So instead of recreating it in Mojo, I use the PSD file. The same for the base. Instead of redrawing everything, I just decided to use the PSD file. And I think it's one of the coolest tools of Mojo. Because for example, Here's this monolith that, if you notice, is just a rock moving. And the cool thing about this is just one smart bone. It's just one smart bone with one control to the left and one control to the right. And the animation is only that movement in a linear, in a linear way. Not Bezier, nothing is just straight. And this is awesome. I have to, it's one of the coolest things of Moho, I think, is the match warp. I did it with match warp. At this moment, I'm not going to do a tutorial for match warp because there are a few of them in, in YouTube. They're awesome. So you can learn. But this was how I used to do it in 3D in Blender. I love Blender, but <laughs> this tool of Moho was really good. I used to do all these polygons and importing the texture, putting the lights, shaders. Even there were uh, simple shaders, like shadeless materials. You spend more time. It, it was it was a little bit annoying to do it. It looks good, but I think now probably I did this in maybe half a day. I'm not the best in 3D. <laughs> But this took me 30 minutes. So use this tool for giving life to environment or I don't know, objects, whatever you need, because it helps us a lot for saving time and creating more, more things. I think Felipe wanted to say something about this. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I think this uh, is really a, a good example of how animation can influence design and rigging can influence design instead of the other way around. Uh, when I did this uh, monolith, I obviously intentionally made it like faceted and low poly, inspired by the Tiwanaku stonework of Lima. But uh, I sent it to Spiro like to make some experiments. Like we all, we, all, we, we should take time, some time to like do animation tests, etc. <laughs> I, I, I was like uh, doing exercise outside and when Spiro sent me this on the phone, I was blown away. I was like completely, uh, I was like laughing out loud uh, outside, like, uh, because it, I think this opened my mind into such such many things. It was always a dream for me, like to really have something done in a bitmap raster fashion in Photoshop, for example, and then it make it move so naturally uh, in the real world. 
being an animator and being a designer, uh, sometimes it's tough because you have to make compromises. You can't do anything uh, however you want because you know it, it, it will be animated first. It, it needs to be rotated, etc. And the 3D workflow is nice, but being a wizard in 3D is like really difficult. Uh, and I think this is a middle ground that it's fascinating. I think, for example, we had uh, uh, some other examples, the textiles on the uh, priests that we did on the same video of Lima. It's a very intricate pattern, but it's a simple mesh that moves it. And I think that's very interesting. Now you can, for example, focus on rotating things that are uh, pertaining to the character, elbows, shoulders, hands, wrists, like in flat colors. But maybe now you can have that character wear like a really beautiful cape that only like two bones can move. I think it, uh, for me, I was I was completely blown away. And it's, it's a good example that how a ring software can influence your design process. So after this like monolith that I received from Spiro, like all of my designs consider this like huge things that are beautifully like rendered with a lot of texture uh, details, but subtle rotation and movement. And I think the mesh is like perfect for that. OK, I'll continue with the other files. Uh, some people also ask me, uh, how do I animate threads and clothes, fabrics? So sorry. there are two ways that I'm using to animate clothes. One is, honestly, the most basic stuff is <laughs> I just grab the vertex and I move it. So it's an easy way to animate. If you find something easy to solve problems, just go for it. And don't look for the most professional stuff. I like to freestyle <laughs> while, while I'm animating. So these are only one point moving. If you notice, it works, it works completely good, I think. And it's simple. It took me 30 seconds, <laughs> maybe less. So don't break your brain trying to, to do stuff. If you find an easy way, I think this works good. But also, for example, here, that's why I'm talking about separating layers. If you notice, I'm also moving the shadow. And if you have everything in the same layer, it's going to be really difficult to have a nice movement. And with two layers, so simple, it makes everything more natural. If you notice, is this shadow moving? It doesn't even have the same like uh, time of movement, but it works. It has the feeling of the shadow. And I did the same for the cloth. For example, here, it's only that. And I follow the movement of the bones. I did the same for everyone. And I have the light that I also move. I didn't have a smart bone on it or something in particular. It was only moving the vertex. But since I don't know which project, but two projects ago of Tessus, the last two projects of Tessus, I start doing this that I think is an awesome way of doing it. That I have a small bone or every or almost every vertex. So if you go here, you can notice this bone, control this one and this, these two ones, this one in the middle, this one in the two in the corner, and this one also in the middle. So then I just move the bones. And I think this way is cooler because you can, well, sorry. You can see the movement of the bones, so it's more visual. It's easy to understand the movement. You can even notice the overlap of the bones moving. Like this one goes to the left, and this one arrives a little bit later. So you can notice all this movement. But also, you can mix. For example, here, I add the bones, but I fix some stuff with this. So don't feel pushed to always use bones or one technique. You can always mix technique. And for the last, I want to show you one file that I haven't opened. Sorry for this. I'm going to open it now. That is this one. We saw it, but it has a little bit of everything. So I wanted to show you. 
So here you have the monolith that we all already talk, but here you have clothes and you can see the whole scene that we did with Felipe. Even it's the same uh, position. This was the, the board. Well, this is the render, honestly. <laughs> but if you notice, it has everything here. So you have these threads, you have the character, and here in the character, I did the same as the monolith. I love the design, and I didn't want to recreate it in Moho. I love this shape. So I wanted to keep it and I saved a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of time redrawing this, just using the match and mixing every technique. For example, this has a match warp. This is the match. But here in this point, I even moved the match for creating this feeling of cloth. So don't feel pooch about always using one smart bone or one technique. Always mix if you have the chance and if you need it, of course. And for example, here also the character only had this one movement that was really simple. That is a turn of the head, but it feels really nice. I like this about the work of, of designer Felipe, that the same he was talking about with shapes, you can do a lot of stuff. And here only moving this design inside of this shape, it creates this feeling of movement. Also with this match, I recreate also, it's another match and use it for the other rocks. You also have here. Also this, uh, I'm going to add this information. Don't spend too much time animating things that you know that you're not going to see like with details. For example, these animals are walking but have some mistakes. But if you're looking at this, you will never notice that. So be smart and why spending time like spend time in the most important animations if something looks good keep it i used to do a lot of mistakes <laughs> in the beginning when i started using moho doing a lot of uh, actions and fixing bones and at the end i only used 10 or 20 percent of the rig or of, of the fix of movements and if you're not going to use it whatever you know like <laughs> I, even uh, as a recommendation, a lot of time I start animating without any smart bone. Like I start moving the character and when I'm noticing that I need something, I start adding the smart bones. But yeah, this is all. I think I don't have anything more to share, but I hope you like it. And I hope all this webinar help you to understand a little bit of our process and how we do these test projects. So thank you so much. Thank you, Spiro. Thank you, Felipe. It has been an amazing webinar. Everybody is really excited and they have all learned a lot from your presentation. And um, well, at first we asked from which part of the world were you watching us today? So we just want to say thank you to Matthew from Toronto, for example, Casey from Germany, Vanessa also from Berlin, Leo, Nigeria, Jay, Scotland, Luke, Florida, Brian Costa from California. No, Brian from Costa Mesa, California. Mm -hmm. I think Limbo was watching us also from Mexico. So thank you all. Uh, just I'm going to start here on one a comment about Marcus. Awesome. Thank you so much for this amazing webinar. Uh, Matthew said it's a huge honor. These guys are great. So I just wanted to share all the love from the community. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. Uh, so before uh, that was before now, let's go with the, some questions. Uh, Fuge says, uh, do you storyboard the motion before you create the images? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, even before storyboarding, you must like imagine it in your head, right? Uh, to get excited about it and to inspire yourself to draw the first uh, drawings. And sometimes, even for a project, you can record yourself doing the action to see if it fits the timeline, if it's uh, fits the pace, etc. Everything goes. Everything is, is valid uh, when planning stuff. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one from 
uh, limbo. One doubt, Blender is used only as a reference for models or are some object exported to Moho? Um, I used to use Blender just for these um, objects, but for these projects, I do the Blender for the robot that are in the videos flying is done in Blender, but it's the only thing that is done in 3D, all the rest is done in Moho. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Brian McVeigh says, how long did it take you to rig the bike? What challenges did you face? Uh, it took me, I think, one day and a half, maybe two, I don't remember. But I think the most difficult part was all the details and moving the order of the layers. That's why I, I was annoying a lot with that, like recommending this thing about creating a lot of layers because you need to move it and the the order of the layers so that i think that was the most difficult part and also while i was animating uh, i was fixing some stuff and also moving vertex inside the rig or inside the animation so yeah the rig took me yeah one day and a half two but it was a constant process to fixing it or creating or adding stuff to to the rig the other thing I, I could add to that is when I designed the, the bike, I obviously had in mind what needed to be done after in Moho. And as you can see, like the center shape is a sphere, like the drum is a cylinder. Like if you know how to break uh, things down into simple layers, uh, you can like save a lot of time. And obviously, obviously uh, drawing, the, drawing it in different angles before reading, like making like three drawings, uh, to know how it will rotate uh, actually before adding more detail. Yes, I, I, for example, I have the bike here. I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen, I think. Yeah. So Felipe sent me this, and as he said, it has a lot of nice shapes. It's, at the end, you are masking a lot. That's why I'm also saying that <laughs> do everything in folders. I even have, for example, the cables. Well, I'm going to, he sent me first this image the character in these three positions. So I have the three images for the main rig, but let me <clears throat> turn on this. I Even for this, I have a mask for one cable, and it's only that, and it has this small shadow, and I separate everything. So that's the most important stuff, like cable, shadow, in the center was the same. You have the center, well, the base, a layer for the light, and another layer for the shadow. So I think that's the main secret. I use a lot of layers and separate everything the most as possible, lights and shadow at least. Um, well, uh, people are still sending a lot of love. So thank you. For example, Cynthia Nagel, thank you for joining us, Cynthia. Your work is exquisite. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I learned a lot about the connection between design and rigging and the value of slow movement. Um, Claudio says, thank you for a great webinar from Ottawa, Canada. Claudio and Roxanne, they're watching us. Uh, Diego Soto from Chile. Um, let's go for another question. Uh, Joel Mayer, uh, Joel, thank you for joining. Uh, have you upgraded to Moho 14 and which new feature are you most excited to play around with? Um, I have to be really honest, I haven't tried yet uh, Moho 14, but I'm really looking forward to use the fire and all those elements and the booleans. I haven't <laughs> used it because I was traveling and I arrived to Chile a few weeks ago and I started working. But when I have free time, I want to check that. And mainly the, uh, those tools, they look really, really nice. Yeah, I, I also agree with Spiro. Like, uh... The booleans, like for making interesting shapes, maybe we have characters that are sh shaped like an amoeba in the future, maybe shapes that are more organic, right? Uh, it, it, each time, like the program adds a new feature, like I am really uh, asking myself how this will be influencing my next designs, right? So, yeah, I, I'm really like also very excited to try these new features. And we are also excited. Hopefully, we see your next project with Moho 14. Um, 
another question let me see there are so many questions thank you guys all for sending your your comments um casey says inspiring to hear and see how much love went into this learned a lot thank you uh, vanessa ricky thank you so much for sharing i learned a lot here one from luke let's come uh, how much time did you have on these projects uh, for pre-production to final render ah uh, it varies from time to time but it's pretty consistent too i think uh we always have like two to three weeks to do, do the animation compositing and editing etc cetera, etc cetera. and pre-production takes uh, from half of that to two weeks it varies a little but it's more or less like a month uh, a month and a few days uh, yeah it's not a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can tell but the results is amazing so you guys are wizards um, let's see another question this is a nice question who are uh what are your inspiration for creating such believable unbelievable worlds i uh, talking for myself i am from the beginning i i have been really in love with everything sci-fi uh from watching star wars as a kid uh, dune etc like uh, i always work it to do something like that so i obviously try to to put as much as the things I love into my work. I think when you work in publicity or advertising, uh, you must strive to put things you're passionate about in your own work, however you can, uh, because it, it, it will translate you in something that is more, more like you, and you want to really like let the client know about you and what you're passionate about. So yeah, like lots of uh, science fiction, and the colors, I, I'm really like drawn to to traditional art, uh, and like the, the colors I like really love come mostly from unusual places. I I don't like to light everything up in a huge vibrant way, but I love like to create like deep color contrast, and that comes all from painting, from traditional painting, traditional arts. Like I really try to inspire myself from outside of the world of advertising to. To try to get more unique stuff into it but also to try to learn new stuff myself so yeah um from my side i don't know like well felipe is the designer so he's the one who <laughs> need this inspiration from other places but yeah i, I also like, love sci-fi star wars but as an animation inspiration i don't know if i have a specific one i like to <laughs> watch classical cartoons like <laughs> old cartoons and for animating yeah so he say i don't have a specific inspiration i just have fun doing this likely i, I work in what i love and i enjoy moving stuff <laughs> moving characters and moving objects so yeah i don't have like a specific inspiration i think i also think that uh, i have been watching a lot of anime recently and i love the the ability and the like crazy ideas they come up with to save time animating like just this thing or uh, just animating some lights here and there like there's a lot a lot of to learn all from that uh, uh, production style yeah yeah i think also and um, i was watching yesterday uh power pop girls <laughs> they have a lot of technique also from that they they just animate few mouths or few stuff and it looks so nice so Maybe I think inspiration is everywhere when you watch animation. In anime, it's, it's really nice. Or as Felipe said, there's so many cool ways to save animation. Like, for example, in Dragon Ball, all these characters speaking really far from the shot. They don't even move them out. They are only moving layers. But yeah, <laughs> that's that's my inspiration, I think. Awesome, guys. Um, the... Unfortunately, our time is kind of limited. Let's go with the last uh, few questions. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, regarding if you use a uh, specific software for um, motion um, um, motion boards or storyboard, uh, if you use any Adobe uh, for it or you go directly into Moho. 
Uh, no, obviously uh, for storyboards, pen and paper is the best way to go. Uh, and for the style frames, I use Photoshop. Uh, I would love to learn to use Procreate well because like iPads are so light and, and you can take them anywhere. But for the moment, I use uh, Photoshop. And um, well, another question here is uh, about uh, trial and error. If you guys uh, spend time on, on trying to test things, uh, how do you guys, or do you go directly from your head to animate uh, stuff? I think that you can, if you have the time, for sure, like uh, test new ways to or, or try new, new new things. When you have little time, I think the pre-production or the planning you did before like really comes handy. I think uh, as we as we talked about, like if the storyboard and the design makes sense to rig and animate, the process will be easier. But there are many other things you can do. For example, when I animate characters, I do use a lot of uh, video reference of myself. For example. Or even when I'm playing a scene on a animatic, I maybe record the action and see if it works in pacing, if it works uh, on that time, etc. And in terms of animation, uh, I think the trial and error is like, a, for me at least, it's a life process. You, when you are animating, you're constantly looking and inspecting yourself, right? You're not. Uh, nothing comes right at at first time. Uh, even a simple walk, you can. There's always things that you are adding and subtracting, and I think the trial and error is like continuous. If someone gave me like two more weeks, I will <laughs> use it properly to to try new stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You just you must just do uh, do what you can with the time you you were given. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and one last uh, well, I'm not going to read this comment uh, from Andrew Walker, uh, which is really great. As a film as a filmmaker, a lot what you said about less is beautiful instead of more. I do it with my live action films, and I hope to put it into my animations when I begin using more. Thank you, Andrew. And and Lisa also says this presentation is so impressive. Thank you. Um, she says, uh, if you're just starting out learning Moho, where where should you start? And we can close uh, with this question about any suggestion for anyone who's starting with Moho. I would say like straight to YouTube, go for the basic stuff. I think in, in your channel, you have everything. And I think the most difficult part is to be consistent, like do it every day, at least 15 minutes and go for it, like practice, practice, practice. Luckily, I think I always say this software is so easy because it's really simple. There are a lot of tutorials. The community is really nice. So I think the most difficult part rather than learning software is to continue studying it and more than study the software, also moving, moving stuff, doing animation inside, uh, make mistakes like going wrong, totally wrong, is the only way to, to learn and to get getting better in the software and in animation, I think. Well, with those wise words, uh, we get to our closer in this amazing webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Felipe. Thank you so much, Spiro. Uh, we definitely took notes uh, from your experience. And just last words, uh, the future is 2D. Moho is a powerful 2D animation software that combines the most powerful animation technology with state-of-the-art professional animation tools. Draw, rig, and animate easily. You can create your characters directly in Moho with its vector tools optimized for animation or import images or Photoshop files, keeping the link and layer structure. For more information, visit mohoanimation.com. And also, many of you asked if this webinar has been recorded. Yes, we'll host it in our YouTube channel. Uh, stay tuned, uh, subscribe to receive a notification. Also, follow us in our socials to, to stay tuned with all our, our webinars, promotions, tutorials, uh, etc. about Moho on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok. Also, as uh, 
I think as Piro mentioned, the community is very welcoming and you can learn a lot from other Mojo animators. Join our Discord and our forum. And also to keep up with the, the latest project of Felipe and Spiro, don't forget to follow them on their Instagram Vargas Luber and Spiro underscore Buster. So with that, once again, thank you so much, Felipe. Thank you so much, Spiro. Thank you so much, everyone, and I hope you have a really, really nice you. Christmas. Yes, thank you all. Uh, this has been a great year. Uh, we are closing 2023 with this amazing webinar. So happy holidays, all of you. Uh, we we just wish you the best 2024 for all of you and your animations and more. So stay tuned and see you next time. Bye bye.